Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, welcome to the, the panel discussion today. We have a quite an interesting and uh, esteemed panel of, uh, of I call them experts and passionate researchers in the field of artificial intelligence, different aspects of AI. Um, the panel is entitled AI Theory and Practice, Hard Challenges and Opportunities a Ahead. And um, I basically want to keep this informal. Um, we have a, maybe a smattering of PowerPoint here and there, but largely just conversation. And I hope to involve the audience as well with feedback and comments. Um, and the idea was to basically um, ask people to, to share their thoughts about the key challenges ahead in theory and or practice uh, uh, in what's a fairly broad area of research uh, under the constellation, uh, the, 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 the name artificial intelligence it includes quite a few subdisciplines. And in fact, if you asked you know, a large number of researchers, you know, what, what, what is the main field of various people on this panel? They may not even say AI, they might say HCI, um, you know, e-commerce, they might go down on the, on the ontology of the, the topic space. So we have a variety of people here with different interests and backgrounds. Um, and I asked them to talk about not just the key challenges ahead, but potential opportunities and promising pathways, trajectories to solving those problems. And of course, in doing that, people might want to share their uh, predictions about how R&D might proceed in terms of the timing and of various kinds of develop developments over time. And also, um, I asked people to briefly in, in, to frame their comments, maybe by sharing a little bit about even what it is they're talking about. Like, what is the goal? Um, not everybody um, stays up late at night, uh, hunched over a, a computer or a simulation or a ro robotic system, um, pondering the foundations of intelligence and human-level AI. There's, there's a variety of goals in the field, too. Um, so uh, with that, let's get going. Uh, we have uh, here today um, uh, Leeds Gator from University of Maryland, Devik Subramanian, um, who uh, comes to us from Rice University. Um, we have Carlos Gestrin from CMU, James Hendler, RPI, Mike Wellman at Michigan, Henry Kautz at Rochester. Um, we know him as a Northwest person, even though he's in Rochester, because he was here for a number of years at UW. And Joe, Joe Constan, who um, comes to us uh, from uh, the, uh, the, the Midwest. He's our, our um, uh, I guess, the, the, your, your, our, our Minneapolis person here on, on staff. And finally, playing Mike Wellman from, from, from University of Michigan here today. So let's start uh, in order of, uh, we'll go, we'll go uh, um, from Joe, which is my right facing this way, or left this way, and we'll come, we'll come this way, getting to, I guess, PowerPoint at the end. Right, Lise? Okay. So, so Joe, your, 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 your I'm not remarks? I'm call, but I do need my notes. Oh, this is not on. Are we on now? Oh, if I talk into it, it will work much better. Okay. So um, I was actually surprised when you invited me to this panel because, like you were saying, I don't think of myself as an AI person, I, though I've been to AI conferences and have worked in recommender systems. Uh, I think of myself at the core in human-computer interaction. And so I went back and started looking at what I knew of artificial intelligence to try to see where the path forward was. And I was inspired by the past. I was inspired by going back to the vision of Turing, of Weizenbaum, of Minsky, going back and realizing that while people may have gone too far in trying to turn computers into thinking like humans, that actually the Turing test was remarkably inspiring if you t treat it as the question of how do we engineer computer systems to interact appropriately with humans. I don't think Turing was exactly right. I don't think you have to fool a human into believing that you're human, but what you have to do is be good enough that you don't distract a human by acting rudely, automatically, inappropriately. And what I want to do is just run through a handful of examples of why this isn't trivial and why we're often doing the wrong thing, some of which will take us towards, yes, we have real potential. So in my own area of recommender systems, one of the things that we learned 
is that it's much easier to optimize the quality of your prediction if you measure that by saying how well do I predict some data that's sitting off in a database than it is to come up with recommendations that people actually appreciate. We've done a bunch of studies that show that people would prefer recommendations that are less good but more interesting. Now, obviously, good there means accurate. They would prefer more diversity at the expense of accuracy. They would prefer less obviousness. That's all about human qualities that we can engineer into a system once we understand them. We've also learned that some things that should be obvious, like explanation, are remarkably difficult. That if you actually tell somebody how you came up with it, uh, we found it depresses somebody's willingness to believe that the data is any good. And that caused me to reflect back to my you know, AI1 course, where I remember reading about Meissen and you know, how wonderful <laughs> this was, and said, you know, what was Meissen's great failure? You could argue there were two of them. One, that the researchers didn't anticipate the liability and insurance industry. Um, and the other one is it was a human interface problem, that people don't necessarily want to go and type into a bunch of yes-no questions into a computer to get an answer, even with a rule-based explanation, that if you'd taken that just a step further and solved the human problem, it might have worked. Related to that, I was remembering a bunch of these smart house projects. And I have to admit, I hate all of them. Um, I hate smart spaces. I, I think everyone hates smart spaces. And here's a simple example of a question that AI needs to answer, which is, if you're about to turn off the lights to save energy because the sensors think some, that there's nobody there, do you warn people and give them a chance to answer? Now, there's no good answer to this question. I can tell you if that person is in bed asleep, the answer is no. Don't wake them up to say, hey, I'm about to turn off the lights. I can also tell you that if they're in the bathroom very still, the answer is yes. You don't turn the lights off on that person. They're dealing with problems enough on their own. And how do you distinguish those two things in a system with anything other than ad hoc rules? How do we learn those behaviors? How do we model enough about humans to say what's respectful? A couple of other examples. Clippy. Why do we love to hate Clippy? Well, I think you know more than, than I do, but there were two obvious ones that jumped out in the commercial implementation some of which was better in the research world. One of them is understanding history and context, that the first time you tell me something, it's new. The fourth time, it's annoying. If your stack is one deep, you never understand history. That's obviously not deep AI. But the second one, I think, is bigger, which is understanding concepts like subtlety, that maybe the question being asked, you know, the, hey, looks like you're writing a letter. I can help. As true as that may be, putting a little icon in the corner that says, you know, format as letter or letter wizard and letting the person take the initiative might be more subtle and more human. Um, last couple of examples here. If you look at uh, the work going on in interruption and attention, both here, Brian Bailey's work at, uh, at Illinois, there have been other people doing work in this area. That to me feels like a great AI problem. You have sensor fusion, you have all of this different information, all of whose goal is how do we get our computers to be respectful, have them take their appropriate place. A lot of the work going on in online community and how can we get an online community that manages its members feels like a great problem in AI. Uh, a lot of the work going on in online health and persuasive computing, how do we diagnose where somebody is in their own mental decision making and their own behavior change and adapt the interaction to most effectively help that person get to where they want to go, those are great problems in AI. And so I guess my answer to where are the challenges and opportunities, they go back to that original vision. The challenge and the opportunity is how do we build computing systems that may have their own goal, but that in their interaction with humans, interact in such a way that humans can interact naturally and in a trusted way with those systems. That, fabulous. Thank, thanks very much, Joe. Henry Couch okay. from so, Manchester. Uh, I think many people would agree that uh, the, probably the, the greatest crisis facing um, uh, the world, probably I guess next to global warming, is coming up with the, the ability to provide health care to all individuals. And what's interesting when you look at um, uh, 
why we need health care is, is most money is spent on conditions that either could be prevented through education and lifestyle changes um, or are completely non-preventable because it's simply a matter of growing old. And uh, so this is a domain that I've been interested in uh, for the last several years is applying uh, AI uh, to create systems that could interact with people uh, to provide levels of, of, of caregiving and to help influence people's uh, behaviors in, in positive manners. Um, and it, it grows out of uh, work in things like, like smart homes and things like interruption uh, to get to a point where you have systems that can, uh, for example, uh, monitor a person's activities of daily living, uh, notice uh, changes in their behavior, and ultimately uh, interact with them to provide help, provide assistance, and uh, uh, so on. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great domain because not only is it socially relevant, but it, it, it's a, uh, a place where you can bring together basically all AI technology, um, sensing, state estimation, uh, natural language, uh, and, and so on. And I, I agree strongly with uh, Joe that an awful lot of the, the work in the area, uh, uh, it's easy to get a negative reaction to because it seems to be insensitive to um, human factors and, and, and human needs. So uh, I think that's not a reason not to do the work, but that, that is a reason that when you're doing the work, you always have to spend time also uh, talking to end users, uh, uh, doing you know, focus groups with nurses, with, with families, uh, uh, with caregivers. And when you bring them into the loop, it, can, um, it sort of goes both ways. It's just, it both opens uh, the eyes to, to, of, of the public to what could be done with technology and can also uh, open your eyes as a researcher to what are really the, the core problems to address. All right. Thanks, Henry. Mike? Uh, thanks. I'm, I'm glad, um, I'm glad that uh, Joe pointed out uh, that accuracy and prediction is not everything because um, I was going to choose not to pr try to predict what the next best uh, opportunity uh, is, uh, in part because I've never been especially accurate about that um, in the past, um, and also because I'm not sure that um, that is really the way that um, successful res long-term research enterprises uh, uh, actually proceed. I think in the um, AI area, opportunities are just so dense. Uh, that is, there are so many rich problems such that any really good idea in AI is going to clearly going to have uh, wide and, uh, and important benefits that we don't really have to uh, be extremely tactical about this, except with respect to our own positions and our own opportunities and, our, and what, what it really engages our own uh, interests. In thinking back to uh, you know, how I wound up in the problems I work on, um, I gave a talk yesterday about my research. I won't go into that on, on uh, um, trading agents and markets. Um, I was originally motivated by dealing with markets, markets as a way to um, decentralize resource allocation problems. And for many years, if I had a, uh, was on a panel like this, I would uh, proselytize for why our software agents need to be market aware, and that's the most important uh, 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 domain. Um, what I did not, especially enterprise, uh, uh, anticipate was the um, electronic commerce uh, explosion from... Uh, uh, ten years ago, uh, thinking back to 1995, um, if you were doing X research in 1995, you said, hey, I should do X research on the web. And I was doing markets and auctions, so, <laughs> so um, you know, that's how I wound up with it. Wasn't, it wasn't really um, uh, foresight there. Um, I think it was, it's kind of interesting, uh, just in this uh, uh, conference, we've heard uh, some other talks. I think Eric mentioned um, uh, a little market-based task allocation for allocating um, uh, computational resources. We heard a lot of stuff about the computing cloud and how maybe the decentralized resource allocation kinds of issues are going to come up big again. So um, uh, maybe that original motivation uh, will come back. I think I really latched on to the electronic commerce approach, not just because of the um, value of the opportunity, but because it gave me a way to, um, an excuse to stop trying to argue with people about why markets might be good. The point was that uh, whether you like it or not, markets are out there, and uh, uh, it's a domain that um, uh, is important to deal with. So I think you know you all can pick your problems by again just finding something that uh, engages you, and um, uh, any 
uh, any thing that you latch onto there is going to have wide benefits. And, and I could vouch for uh, you know Mike being <coughs> deeply focused on on markets and notions of a kind of electronic commerce way before the the, the upswing of this technology uh, with, with the uh, web <coughs> web applications. <coughs> in fact, um, I think you were actually visited MSR in 1995 or so, 1996, whatever it was, and you said. We, 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 together we were thinking about this uh, world where we said, can you believe that eBay came to exist? We were just, we were just marveling at the prospect that this, you know, the concept, it was, seemed so, seemed so uh, alien at the time that it actually was happening right before our eyes. Well, I remember in 1996, um, we, when we you know, found out about eBay and we saw that they had done, they claimed that they had done $60,000 worth of uh, total uh, volume. <laughs> it was, pretty, just, impressive. It was just, pretty impressive then. That then. was very impressive. I <laughs> said, if we could never get that with our system, that would be great. <clears throat> Okay, Jim. So, so I've been I've been looking around the panel. Um, I think age-wise, there's a couple of us who are close. But since I started doing AI as a freshman in college, I probably have been doing it. I, I get to claim longest. Um, Big pause. And, and for the and, and for the past, <laughs> so so for for more years than I'm going to admit, but many people in the room weren't born yet. Um, I've been doing more or less the same thing which at various times in my career have been mainstream AI, not <coughs> AI, sort of AI, and now I'm not even sure how to categorize because some people in, the, in AI even have heard of the semantic web and, and think maybe there's some relation. Other people think it's all about AI, which is, you know, wrong. Um, but, but so thinking about what to say today, I, I, I Thought back a couple years ago, we had a fellows forum for the 50th anniversary of the Dartmouth conference, which I was not at. Um, and the, um, the idea for what I was going to write about, so we were supposed to write a sort of one pager on more or less the same topic, it was just not coming to me, future of AI, I just couldn't come up with it. And I had, I had a dream, literally, a, a, a nightmare. It was one of those dreams where, you know, I was in front of the room and it was time to give my presentation. And I, I was fully dressed, but, but my, <laughs> I didn't have my slides. And, and no one would tell me what, what my talk was. And I finally found the program. And the title of my talk was, Computers Play Chess, Humans Play Go. And I woke up realizing that that was the answer that I'd been looking for, that that was, you know, my brain kind of telling me for the pe at, at one point, many years ago, the reason chess was picked as a really hard problem to challenge computer science and, and motivated a lot of early AI was not because we wanted a chess player. It was because we picked a really hard thing humans could do and computers couldn't. Okay? And now we actually play chess better than most people and, and even some programs better than the best people. And there are other games and other things, uh, the learning stuff. So predicting traffic in Seattle, we beat the pants off the average Seattle driver, according to Eric. But, but what about all the stuff that humans do better? That used to be what AI was about, was looking at that stuff and saying, you know, what is that? What's it all about? How do we do that? Uh, you know, let me use the game of Go, right? You can't solve Go using combinatoric things, at least for another 40, 50 years, if you've just believed Mo Moore's law. And even then, it'll take till the heat death of the universe to do it computationally. Um, Go has all these things we used to talk about in the planning community, like non-local effects and patterns and things like that. You go to a current planning conference, you won't find anybody talking about those things. You go to the learning conference, you hear almost all about mathematical models of learning and data mining and things like that, you, you hear almost nothing about how is it that children can differentiate uh, the stories they're reading that are fables and the stories they're reading that are, you know, real life things. So the one with the talking crow, very few kids go out and think the crow actually talks, right, and go talk to crows. I mean, so, so there's a lot of really hard problems that have to do with what intelligence really is that we have forgotten, that we have stopped looking at because we're looking where we know how to do stuff better than people. So I guess what I see as the real challenge is once many years ago, the cognitive side of AI and the computational side of AI were in something of a balance. 
And somehow they've gotten very, very badly out of balance. The people who think about humans, human relationships, trust, respect, reliability, we have computer definitions for all those things that have almost nothing to do with what humans mean by those things. Right? It's time for us to actually go back to the thing we were originally looking at, which is intelligence. To look at the different kinds of intelligence, to look at the different models of intelligence, and start saying, what are the things we don't know how to do? Right? And I think that's our real challenge. It's not grand challenge problems. Let's make a faster robot. Let's make a bi bigger robot. It's, you know, let's make something that can attack some of the stuff that we don't right now know how to do. So I'll stop there. Oh, I have a microphone here. Thank you. So, thanks. Uh, actually, on this note, totally, totally aside, my, I don't know if this microphone okay? Yeah? <laughs> my, my grandfather is a doctor, and when he said, you know, I was working in AI, he wanted me to transplant mosquito brains into humans because they thought it would make some humans smarter. So, <laughs> I don't know. But a, a, anyway, uh, many of you have, uh, have seen um, my talk yesterday, so I'm not going to talk about the research that I've done. But I'm going to mention again the last few slides that I had in the talk. So, last, uh, you know, recently I've been having some AI completeness envy. So, I've been thinking about, you know, what is a bigger, uh, interesting, AI complete challenge, and maybe not challenge problem is the wrong word, but an AI complete problem that will be interesting to tackle that does not involve, let's say, a robot that saves the universe. So it doesn't involve uh, some big hardware, but maybe it involves uh, a system that will be accessible for most AI researchers. So maybe information that is available on the web as an example. And so I'd like to have a problem where we can have an aspect of data collection, we can have an aspect of high level chaining of information and aspect of decision making. And if I can go home and get some ideas from you guys, I think this would be really exciting for me. I uh, I'd like something that ends up being pretty cool or very cool and that really showcases AI. So here's my first proposal. Uh, I, I mentioned it yesterday. I don't know how many of you have seen factcheck.org. Factcheck.org, yeah. Uh, pretty cool place. You have statements there that politicians have made, for example, and they try to analyze, collect information, and try to justify whether it's true or not. You may not believe on their analysis, but that's part of a system. So you can imagine an automated fact-checking system where you provide some uh, fact that you're trying to figure out, but it's not just what's the capital of Finland, but something that requires you to chain multiple bits of information. And that includes a user interaction part where you can learn about what the user trusts or does not trust about this information. And I think if we mm -hmm. had that system, it would be extremely useful for all of us. So this is one example, I think. But it would be cool to discuss some high-level AI goals. I don't know if you're taking questions or not. But Why don't we just wait till, till we're finished? Hang on to it. Um, if you think it's going to evaporate, we can take it now. But if you hang on to it, it would be great. Um, are you done, Seth? Yes, sir. I mean, Seth, hold on to it. Carlos. Oh, Devika. Terrific. Um, I think I don't know if this is on. Do you, you, you mean the Scotty uh, <laughs> in the 20th century here? 20th century. Beam me up. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I say don't knock these uh, robots that will save the universe. I don't know how many of you got the spam mail from Life Foundation asking you to become a board member. I did. I went to their website, and they're actually making a, a robot to save the universe. So there you go. There are people who are doing that. Um, <laughs> so actually, I, I like what... Uh, Carlos just said, and I, I'm fully respectful of uh, all of the panelists before me, I, I just want to reinforce that, you know, AI has made strides of the, over the last 10 or 15 years, and on the computational side, perhaps, losing touch with the cognition side. But I think I know a way we can get back in touch with the cognition side. Because once you've accumulated a whole host of methods and techniques and algorithms, right, we, have, we haven't accumulated that list of great showcase applications in which to demonstrate them. So most of the work I do starts with the mantra, what can AI do for you, right? Riffing off of uh, a UPS tagline that never really worked. I don't know if you know what can <laughs> Brown do for you. So um, I think there are plenty of opportunities uh, in that arena. And I want to say that if we look, uh, as uh, you know, I support Mike Wellman's position that we're going to be gravita we'll gravitate to these based on sort of our own interests and our background and so forth. But I want to quickly run through four examples at four levels of granularity, just to give you an idea of the breadth of things that we can adopt that will really make 
Are peers in computer science aware of what we do? Are peers in the rest of science aware of what we do? And then are peers on the planet aware of what we do? So first off, individual level, right? I mean, and, and this really ties the computational and the cognitive end of AI. Today we have all these modalities. We can observe the human mind at work, you know, through fMRI, through EEG, and so forth. Eye trackers that can look at how we're, what we're looking at. Uh, devices that can tap into our motor actions. So one of the things I've been working on is, can we understand how humans learn specific tasks by tracking such information and fusing them, and understand why some people have difficulty with learning certain families of tasks? The particular task I've been looking at is unimportant. It was something the Navy uses to differentiate between people who are going to be future submariners or not. But my dream is to see that being used in the K through 12 classroom. Imagine, I mean, by this Christmas, every kid in America, well, most kids, uh, will have this Wii cap that they're going to wear along with their Nintendo Wii system, which will allow the machine to infer their emotional state, making the game harder or easier depending on their level of frustration. If, that, if we can process that kind of information and give it to the classroom teacher in a third grade math class, can you imagine what we can do or not do? Well, I mean, we can do this at the city level too. I mean, right, that is an individual level. One of the things I'm doing right now is working with the city of Houston to help it plan for evacuations under disasters such as hurricanes. And the simplest thing that we've been able to do, bringing together sort of decades of research on structural uh, engineering, assessing the viability of your home, I mean, damage to your home with respect to wind, flood, and, and so forth. Uh, and making that information available to all of the citizens at appropriate times so they can take, make rational decisions. Often people <coughs> flee because they have no information. Is my house going to blow down if this hurricane comes over? And then at the country level, I mean, one of the things I'm doing there, but I invite you all to come look at uh, other ways of doing this is, can we build models of the evolution of conflict by tracking news media over time, sort of longitudinally from, I don't know, from whenever online news was available? Can we do that? The answer seems to be a qualified yes. For example, our system can actually, could have seen the Kuwait takeover by Saddam Hussein about four weeks before it actually happened. Why could it do that? Turns out we had a nice model of Saddam Hussein, who turned out to be a fairly predictable fellow. Before he uh, would engage in serious conflict with one of his neighbors, he would engage in a very strategic dance with his neighbors, which I'll characterize in sort of third grade playground terms. If you're going to fight, take on somebody on the playground, you want to find out who's with you, uh, to use our fearless leader's words, you know, who's with me, who's with us, and who's not. So, uh, so you can see that pattern. I mean, so AI technology, I mean, Bayesian networks and the kinds of beautiful things that uh, Eric talked about, for example, it can be used to do that. And finally, at the societal level, I'll leave that out as a challenge. I mean, what can we do that will impact society? I loved Henry's suggestion that, you know, taking on healthcare or taking on energy or something like that. The creativity is going to come from us and our students who are going to see these opportunities leverage to recognize this, right? I have a 10 year old, and the greatest difficulty for me is to make her do these word problems, right? She can add, subtract, divide, and do all those operations. And I think we can Bayesian inference, uh, do all of the computational stuff, no problems at all. But when a problem comes knocking, can we see that here is where we can apply technique X from machine learning and so forth? How do we train the next generation of students to recognize and leverage these opportunities? To me, as an educator, that is the biggest challenge. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much, David. Right. Lisa? Okay, well, uh, following up on uh, Jim's point about feeling naked without uh, slides. I can assure you that you're very well dressed today. Yes. And here's more and dressing. And now I have slides. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so I'm going to say things that definitely echo uh, things that have been said so far. But one of the things that I wanted to mention, following up on what Jim said, is recently there's been a number of AI anniversary. So first off, there was the anniversary of um, AAAI, the organization. There was also the um, 50th anniversary of the coining of the term AI. And so there's a lot to celebrate. And actually, if you go to the materials, you can see a lot of the things that have happened. 
And in case any of you haven't been to the main AAA AI conference in a long time, I would really encourage you to go because in the past few years, I think there's been a lot more energy. There's been a lot of new developments that have been added to the programs and so on. Um, but if you look at these um, retrospectives, you do see some common concerns. So one of the common concerns is the basic kind of fragmentation of the field, that there's a lot of um, sub-conferences and um, so on, uh, that we've lost sight of the bigger AI goals, human-level AI, and in general, the crisis in um, CS education. And what I want to argue is actually these are now turning into opportunities, that um, there's a number of ways in which um, these have changed. And the first one is in terms of fragmentation of the field. I think we've gone from fragmentation actually to collaboration. And many of the things that people have talked about on the panel illustrate that and things that we've seen in the summit so far. Um, so personally, you know, my research area is representation, reasoning, and learning methods for combining uncertainty and logic. And I think, you know, of course, I'm completely biased, but um, I think that they're great for allowing us to deal with noisy, heterogeneous data and provide the kind of um, context-sensitive, adaptive, resource-constrained reasoning that we want. And I do want to hit on also supporting um, the kind of social intelligence that um, I think Jim alluded to and which we've seen in the summit discussed a lot more, not so much in the AI track, but in other parts of the conference, and I think that that's important. And at least for me, and I think this is true of the other panel members that I've talked to, and you know, this has allowed collaboration for me across subdisciplines within AI, um, but also across CS um, and outside CS. Um, so I think that there's a lot of exciting opportunities, and these opportunities actually segue into um, supporting going to newer and bigger goals, which are these um, AI-complete kinds of problems where we really are kind of making a difference. So we've seen and heard a number of these, so Carlos highlighted these very well in his talk, uh, Eric as well, and uh, Devika, and also Henry. Um, and the one that I haven't heard talked about quite as much, so I'll just add in a pointer to it, is um, these new kind of social uh, information processing kinds of things. There was a triple AI spring symposium. Uh, Christina Lerman was one of the organizers of this, where this is very much the, okay, how do you collect together information from a bunch of sources? How do you integrate it and align it? And the thing that really impressed me about this is the really innovative applications that people had for this. So things as diverse as, you know, saving the rainforest in South America uh, to intelligent map um, building and so on. So I think that this is a really exciting area. Um, and then in terms of CS education, there's been some recent events that I think are really exciting. So there was a AAAI Spring Symposium on using AI to motivate greater participation in computer science. And then there was also a teaching forum um, at AAAI that had a lot of um, neat uh, things going on, including the AI and education colloquium. Um, mm -hmm. I encourage you to look at these things. Um, Maren Sahami was the, one of the big organizers, also Marie Desjardins and Adele Howe, um, and a lot of others. But one of the things that I think is exciting here is this notion of AI has developed enough. I remember the first AI class that I took, I did not like it all. This is going to date myself, but you know, we studied arches and you know, uh, semantic networks and so on, and it seemed like a random collection of algorithms to me. And now, when I teach AI, it's this, you know, okay, we go through representation, different types of representation, reasoning, and learning, and that gives the theory that I think supports computational thinking, um, and also the applications are 
actually compelling and relevant. And um, I think that that's really exciting. Um, so the message is, first off, collaborate. It's fun. Um, I joke with my uh, database collaborators. The other good thing about collaborating is AI conferences are usually not in the greatest locations, but database conferences, for example, tend to be in better locations. Uh, work on problems that matter, so this is echoing um, a number of the things. And educate, and there's lots of challenges in terms of computational complexity, privacy, and I think the visualization to support the inference, the HCI kinds of issues that uh, started off, Joe started off the panel with, and I really think that you can have this <coughs> theory and apply it too. Okay, thanks. Yes. Very good. Can I, can I respond to something Lee said? Sure, go ahead. <coughs> so the first AI, the, the day I really became an AI researcher was the day I stepped into my first AI course. Uh, Roger Shank was the professor and he went on to become very controversial, but Shank said something that changed my life. He said, you know, what you're gonna learn about in this course is a lot of stuff we don't know the answers to. And any one of you can go on to become a big player in this field. You know, it can really solve hard problems because there's so much we don't know. And the problem is 50 years later, I feel like we still don't know a lot of that stuff. We just know a lot of other things and we have forgotten that we have to keep reminding our students that there's a lot of excitement about the stuff we don't know how to do. So, Lisa, I have a slightly different philosophy from you when I teach my AI class. So, so one, one, just a quick surprise about your comments. I mean, I, I, this is not a big surprise. Is, is, the, is, the, is that I didn't hear very much from any of you on technical issues and opportunities. And let me just ask one question maybe to break the ice in that department. So, and I'll, I'll, I'll use uh, the same mechanism that Carlos used to, to solve his MP hard problem yesterday. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a partial answer. Let's say, I, let's say we assume that a decade from now, you're told, looking back, there were two big surprises. There might be more, but two big surprises happened technically in AI. That pretty were, you know, for us all timers, they, they, very amazing in retrospect. But what, what are these surprises that might, we might encounter technically in terms of things becoming more doable, for example, a new discovery, for example? So I'm giving you the partial answer now, and I used to sort of compute what the, uh, the surprise is. This is per Carlos's uh, trick yesterday in his I talk. Oh. Anybody, anybody have a response to that? I, uh, I, I don't want to ruin the surprise. Okay. <laughs> well, well, uh, consistent with your earlier remarks, Mike. <clears throat> I'm going to say that, that uh, a couple things that, that have surprised me. Um, well, looking one, back from today. You look, looking back, oh. yeah. So, mm -hmm. so one would be... Um, the surprising uh, effectiveness of approximation algorithms for, for uncertain inference and uh, you know, belief propagation, um, different kinds of local search methods. And uh, I think a, an, another su more recent surprise is the, the fact that uh, the, you know, the advances in the statistical relational models, that, it, that, that, that sort of with each paper, it just seems like, oh yeah, that's obviously the way to do it. And, so, and I, I, don't, I think that's kind of a very surprising going back like 10 years. And going forward? The, even the, cat, the, the category of the surprise coming, looking back 10 years from now, 20 years from now, what were the two big, at least the two so, big surprises that occurred technically? So let me do two, one positive, one negative. So I'll start with the negative is, I think 10 years from now we're going to be stunned by the failure of the integrated AI system. I mean, we, I think it's a wonderful thing we're trying it, but I think what's going to stun us is we're going to make tremendous, I mean, they're doing wonderful stuff, but when we actually look at what they do versus what, you know, millions of dollars, team of the top people, 18 schools involved in making this thing, and we're going to, you know, five years from now, look at the demo that some high school student does and say, gee, you know, what, what were we thinking? So, so I think one of the things is not that it's bad to do integrated AI, but that most of the big integrated AI projects are trying to do things that are already well understandable within the context of the single AI problem. Um, I think the second thing that's going to surprise us is, <clears throat> so, so one of the big AI, one of the big unknowns in AI right now is memory. We, we, we as humans deal with memory drastically different than databases or, com or computers do. We're learning a lot now at the neural level 
about what some of that that does, but we're we're also seeing a lot of people working on very different models of what kind of information space you create. And as the computers start to catch up to to that, I think we're going to see the ability to actually say, start doing some of the things we we've been ignoring, like you know, what does this remind you of, and things like that. And I think that's going to make a quantitative difference, a qualitative difference in AI in a way we, we can't even imagine right now. So I'm hoping for that surprise. <laughs> so, oh, I, I, got a, I got this. Um, so I'll be a little bit more controversial since this is supposed to be a panel. Um, so one thing that I've been thinking about quite a bit is uh, the complete death of uh, models. Graphical models, the thing that I know and love, that's going to end. <laughs> um, and I think the reason is that we focus too much on having one model for the way the world works and then committing to that model, which is an approximation, and then trying to, and it's a complex approximation since the world is complex, and trying to do inference on top of this. So I think this entire pipeline is, in my opinion, not the right way of solving the problem. So I've been with uh, some of my students, one who is interning here, Daphne, um, rethinking this pipeline, and I think we're going to kind of change the way we're thinking about problems. So, so my prediction will be that the biggest surprise is not going to come from inside our community, but actually from someone outside working on a hard enough problem that pushes the limits that will inform us about our own models. And let me also say that we have for, for now only looked at, and the reason for the death of the models, I think, which I agree with, by the way, even yeah. though I know and love and use models in all of what I do, is that we're going to make a new family of what I would call lightweight models. The models we have right now are heavyweight models. We're going to make models quickly because the world is changing. We're going to attack non-stationarity at its core and build very lightweight throwaway models and keep redoing that process and integrate that in sort of the inner loop of a pretty fast computation as opposed to the get me 20 years worth of data on X and I'll tell you what will happen today. This is exactly That's what we're going to have on. to go. Oh good, then we and I should talk. I, I see Joe waving his so, mic here. I mean first, this is obviously a no-win question well, because if okay. we're right, then we predicted it and it won't surprise us. But, um, That's okay. but I'm we'll, going we'll to we'll, take we'll a guess prediction. here. What else is the prediction? I hope. Right. I, I don't think so because we're, everyone's listening to us. But I, th I think what we're going to see is the end of the era of attempting to solve things solely through computational intelligence. And that what we're going to see is greater embracing of these systems that bring in, at the very least, human intelligence, whether that's explicit uh, human in the loop systems, whether that's involving, you know, purposeful games in the style of Louis Van Aan, uh, but possibly also animal intelligence, that we may end up that, you know, you shine lights on a colony of ants as part of the computation that solves a hard problem <laughs> because we realize they're things that we just don't know how to compute but that we can infer from others. I also think when we talk about the fact, and, and I think the idea that this is the same problem from 50 years ago, that shouldn't be taken as a criticism of the field. That's actually one of the strengths of the field. It's the same thing that the challenge to go out and explore the universe, we will never meet in anything you achieve. You just realize there's more universe or understanding the origin of the universe. There's something really powerful about pursuing a challenge that you know you will never achieve because it allows you to celebrate everything you did along the way as an accomplishment. I think Lisa, you had a comment? Yeah, so connecting these fragments of models and also to Joe's comment, I think that there's this opportunity for um, keeping track of our context and having multiple roles that we are able to store and to actually uh, take with us different places and we're starting to see that. And I think the thing that will be really interesting to see is, you know, how that develops um, in broader society, you know. There's lots of discussion about privacy and things like that, but then if you look at what's happening with kids and how they view privacy, it's, it's not from the model that um, I do in terms of, like, I don't want anybody seeing my email or something like that. So um, this notion of managing identity and keeping in tra account of context and then 
being able to share that with others so that you can do more things than you could on your own and connecting that into kind of augmenting mm -hmm. intelligence and so on is, I think, fascinating. So Mike? Sorry. Yeah, just to, to follow up on uh, Joe's point about working on these problems that are just well beyond you know, things that we're likely to be able to do. I think that's a, a, uh, a typical form of the kind of surprise. If you look back to the early days of AI and you see these people were working on theorem proving and you know, chess and uh, natural language understanding, and nobody was working on word processing or you know, other things that turns out computers were uh, productive at long before uh, they solved the problems that people were addressing. Um, frankly, that's one of the things I love about AI and attracted me to it originally and keeps me in it. Even though I'm not, I don't view myself as working on the AI complete problems primarily, um, I, I think it's very stimulating to be around the community that is and so that, you know, I think that it's just, it's just a mark of the ambition. Uh, just a, an observation to Carlos, if you're looking for an AI complete problem, um, uh, I can reassure you that it doesn't matter which one you solve, uh, <laughs> by definition. Uh, <laughs> um, and if you don't quite solve it, um, then it didn't matter that it was AI complete. <laughs> That's very true. On that, on that note, let's open it up to the audience. Um, we had at least one question uh, that's, been, that's been cast in the queue. Any, anything else as well? Comments? So Seth, want to go ahead? Uh, strides in understanding how the brain actually works and that kind of technological advance, tools to do that and how it might influence AI and I'm a little surprised. So actually to, to amplify that, I, I, that was, I was going to, during a lull in the conversation I was going to throw this on, on the panel too, resonating with, your, with your, the intent of your question, but we actually do have existence proofs unless you are a deep believer in something else going on, we have, we have existence proofs of, of computation creating all of this, this cognition and our abilities as, as humans and as, uh, even the magic of other vertebrates and invertebrate creatures that have nervous systems. Um, and so one question is also is, is, you know, might there be a surprise in the link between the two? Might we actually understand per representation or model-less reasoning or just-in-time modeling or small models? What's really going on with these naturally evolved uh, tangles of cells that seem to be so marvelous in their abilities? I hope, I hope that you view that as an amplification of your comment. Yeah, I mean, it's related. I'm just, uh, I mean, it's, it's only been a few years that we've had tools. And I'm just surprised that there's not. You guys have a comment no, on that? So I think Eric mentioned it in his talk. I mean, the amazing things going on with the kinds of imaging that you can do now and then trying to kind of connect that with other kinds of information that you have about um, the various functions and so on and being able to do some sort of statistical a analysis to propose models and then have those models be things that you potentially go in and verify in some experimental way. I think there is a potential to um, use the advances in uh, computational intelligence to help do the science and vice versa. And there's, there's, a, there's amazing things going on. You probably saw Tom Mitchell stuff on uh, where they can predict what you're thinking for words that they never seen data for, which is actually pretty cool. But I, I would say to this that I don't think that I'll be highly surprised if the things that we do in AI in the next 50 years uh, will be highly influenced the other way, meaning that the systems we build Will, uh, will directly mimic in some way the way that the brain works. I think some of the models we're building might give us insight into making predictions from the brain, but not necessarily the other I'll just interject as, even as moderator here. So I started out as PhD MD in neurobiology, and in my first year, decided that sticking little electrodes in cells, even though I was somewhere near, near where thought was happening in these creatures, was probably about as, as, as relevant to cognition as putting a little wire into the Apple IIe computer next to me at the time, <laughs> trying to infer the operating system or application level um, of semantics. I think there, are, uh, there is work going on within the field. I'll, I'll, since I'm familiar with my own work, let me just throw some uh, uh, one direction there. I think interpreting the output from these amazing devices and actually figuring out what it means uh, 
For example, right now by correlating visual, motor, and EEG activity, we're building um, models of how humans learn complex tasks with strate strategic as well as visual motor components. So what we're finding is some people have great difficulty in actually translating their strategic, you know, for their frontal lobe activity back and, and, and you know, they don't have the visual hand-eye coordination. And if you, if you observe people at this task and they're failing, you can't tell by just looking at the fact that they're failing whether they're having strategic difficulties with the task, unable to basically come up with decision-making rules, or just an, an inability to execute those rules. So there is work going on now which uses all these new modalities to interpret and diagnose particular types of learning difficulties. So that's one way in which I think AI and AI techniques, and particularly in, say, learning, can come uh, and help. But I would hope that we'd go beyond and shed some light on brain architecture, but we're not there yet. Actually, so so I, think, <clears throat> I think there's a lot we can learn as we, as we do learn more about brain architecture and things like that, but, but I think there's still a limitation, and I think it, it's an inherent problem in some assumptions we made roughly 50 years ago about how to study AI, which, which is the study of the individual entity, right? I mean, there's a lot to be said, but, you know, sort of, let's use the opposite existence proof, right? If you have a kid, you lock them in a closet and you take them out of the closet 30 years later, you don't have a very intelligent entity. Or, or put them in a nice closet. I mean, put them in a, you know, put them on a desert island where all of their, you know, dreams come true. I mean, you still don't have an intelligent entity. So, so again, it's not the deprivation thing I'm talking about. So, so we still aren't at the point where we can start looking at two people communicating in, within fMRIs. We're still not at the point of saying, how does hearing something from someone you trust somehow affect your memory later than if you had heard it from someone you distrust, sometimes in, in surprising ways, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think there's a lot to be done there, but I think when we start looking at what we don't know, again, most of what we're trying to get out of the current brain modeling is how did the stuff that we're actually starting to get pretty good at in AI work. And so, so I think there's a lot, of, a lot of distance, a long way to go before we really can, can say, the, the, the brain-inspired stuff is taking us to the really hard problems. Other, other comments from the audience? Opening it up? Yeah. Beyond, you know, study of the brain uh, and cognition, do you have any other examples of what that might be? Any feel? I think, well, I'm only limited to the examples that I've, I've worked on, so I'll, I'll just say if we can figure out a way to kind of solve hard combinatorial optimization problems, right, uh, the ones that are naturally occurring, that humans today solve also by approximation methods. If we're able to kind of uh, try to tackle that, as Carlos has shown, it's possible if you can you know, do some uh, analyses of it. I think that's where the, sort of the, that would be the recipe for the, for the breakthrough. So it's not by studying, I think it's not by studying how other organisms solve the problem, that that's one way of doing it. Uh, I'm, I want to use the, the, the problem itself, you know, independent of who else solves it as the motivator for, and an absolute benchmark on its, on how well we can do on it as the driver for the problem, as for uh, innovation. Okay, yeah. tell me. So to give a, a completely different problem, management of volunteers. I mean, if you think of the number of voluntary organizations that are out there in the world, uh, and the small number of people who are really good at running these, and you ask, what could I build into a computer system to, if I fed it the data or if it could gather the data on what people have been assigned to do, who they're doing it with, what they thought when they were done, all of the data I have, and you come up with a system, not necessarily to do this autonomously, but to support somebody in keeping your volunteers engaged, healthy, developed, all of that, and you think of all of the cognitive, the social, the sensor data, the fusion of different information involved, I think there's a huge amount of AI, as well as HCI, as well as perhaps non-AI computation that will have to be solved in order to make a dent into a problem like that that has huge social importance. 
I think Kevin has got a question. Oh, Kevin. I can't see Kevin. Oh, back. Wait, okay, go ahead. My glasses on. I, I think people are supposed to wait for the mic because then the webcast and et cetera will actually know what you said. In the meantime, we can reflect quietly as the panel. <laughs> <laughs> Gives me a chance to drink some water. Thanks. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, very right. nicely. I, I previously asked two questions with a turned off mic, so I'm, uh, I'm trying to be better. Uh, so it seems to me that uh, AI has mostly approached the question of, of deciding about action as uh, maximizing or approximately maximizing a well-defined objective function. Um, and it also seems to me that there's very little evidence that this is the way that people decide on how to act. Uh, in fact, you, you know, there's even well-known experiments that show that people's behavior isn't even consistent with any objective function, let alone uh, are people aware of what objective function they, they are responding to. Um, so I wonder um, what you all think of the persistence of this kind of objective function model of action uh, in AI and what alternatives to it you see. Mike? Well, I mean, I think first we need to separate the, uh, the different scientific goals in AI that people are pursuing. And a lot of AI really is still about engineering competent behavior. And for that purpose, having well-defined objective functions uh, follows good engineering principles. And it's, from, from that perspective, um, somewhat irrelevant uh, what humans do. I think the really fortunate thing is that, and, and you know, I think AI people throughout have, have uh, debated these different goals. And um, I think the fortunate thing is that now we can really pursue both without any conflict in that there's so much um, uh, relevant demand for human-like AI uh, that really is human-like because it's going to be used for, for training or for entertainment or for other things where actually being like humans is itself important. So we'll have the opportunity to develop those theories that are going to make decisions the way people do for good reasons and we won't have this, uh, this, real, this conflict anymore. So those of us who are in the you know maybe near term concerned about competence can 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 still keep uh, the principles that we that we know, and then later maybe if we when we find out how to how to make things uh, human like we can now compare and contrast the, their strengths and weaknesses. So so if I can take this into a slightly tangential but controversial level, I think one of the big advances of AI in the last couple of decades or so decade is the definition of objective functions. There was a lot of work in AI before that where it was about, I did this, then I did that, then you know, look at my answer. And so I think it's been a good thing for us, although we might have overfit to this idea. But, so I agree with Michael with everything you said, but I just want to add this. So, so I, can't, I can't disagree with any of the specific words Michael spoke, but I had such a visceral negative reaction to it <laughs> that I know I disagree. And, 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 what I, and, and really where I'm coming from on that is, is, is again, is, is the fooling ourselves into thinking we're making progress because techniques we already understand well can be applied to yet another problem and yet another problem and yet another problem and yet another problem. Yet another problem. That's not even, not only is that not science, that's not engineering. Right? Engineering and science are about solving problems we don't know how to solve yet. They're about, about attacking new and different things. It's not about application building. And in fact, my visceral reaction to a lot of things I've heard on this panel is AI has become about building applications, specific applications, not engineering principles, which, which a lot of the people on this panel got famous for doing is not solving a particular problem using X, but inventing the technique X, which is now being used to solve a lot of problems. Okay, your work in inventing work is, well, what have you invented for us lately, right? Now you're just <laughs> applying and applying. And I, I, mean, I mean, I say this, I say this in a funny way, but you know, if you think about it, we as a field have forgotten about innovation. We as a field have forgotten about, so I don't care whether you're doing it for cognitive reasons, I don't feel, think it matters if you're doing it for things, but, but we have forgotten that the world out there is this amazingly complex and interesting mm -hmm. thing to view from an intelligence perspective, and that 
building a better cell phone isn't, you know, you know, isn't isn't the job of the the scientist. It's understanding the principles that let someone else hey. build a better. But I just got to I just got to say I'm not going to go a little too generic. But I really, really think that we've lost this. Let me just defend the the people on the panel that Henry, for example, has done some wonderful recent work in model counting and so if the foundations still continue, even though he's pointing out some interesting applications. I think the definition of what's a foundation has changed drastically. I, 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 Carlos, you have something yeah. to say, Carlos? Carlos, I, 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 say oh, something. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. I have my own mic. Sorry. Um, no, I totally disagree. Okay. And I have never been fun. So I want to say, um, yesterday I talked about work with my student Andreas Krauser that I think is extremely general and was applied to a wide number of applications. And I tell you how that work started. I was working at Intel Research in Berkeley on a group that is sensor networks. And they were deploying sensors in a forest to understand the microclimate around redwood trees. I, I had a chit chat with one of the people who were deploying sensors and I asked, how do you decide where to put sensors in this forest? And he said, well, wherever looks good, here or there, I just put sensors out, it's all good. And I thought, okay, I'll do a project for a month and help them out and move on. And somehow, you know, we ended up in this uh, huge, very interesting area, which uh, Andreas had a, a big impact on that I think is a fundamental principle in new understanding in AI, which totally was motivated by an application domain. So I don't think, I mean, I don't think uh, it's true for, for whoa, whoa, the other whoa, whoa, people, whoa, whoa. but I don't think it's true. I just wanted to give my own. Whoa, 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 don't get me wrong. Have, have, I, I about, absolutely Jim, was Jim, not saying Jim, it's Jim, bad to work on Jim, let's do you right here. Like Devika first, then back to you again. Okay. Yeah, no, no, I just want to say Devika. So I think it's a, so I too had a visceral reaction to what you said. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I used to be a theoretician in, in my former life, and that was only only 10 years ago, so it's not that, <laughs> that old. Um, I think it's a little bit naive to think that we develop theories. So in my former life, I developed theories, and all I've been doing for the last decade is just punching out, you know, working on a factory going stamp, stamp, stamp as the applications roll by. In fact... <laughs> That's a great metaphor. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> In fact, I have had to forget all the theory I did and <laughs> rethink it. What has emerged instead is much stronger theory. I gave you three examples. One, actually interpreting building models of how humans learn tasks, doing evacuation planning for a major urban city, four million people, predicting conflict by reading news reports across all online sources for over hundreds of or however many years that are available. They all share a core set of computational principles and models and methods. And I understand them much better, even though I was responsible for creating some of them. And I think a much leaner, meaner theory base has emerged by immersing myself in actual problems. And so I, I, I don't think the advances in AI over the last 10 years are an accident. The, the spurt in theory has come because we have been forced in many cases by our funders to actually find actual relevance for this. This has made us more creative, I think. So it's not an either or with, you know, you do theory or do applications, but really they go hand in hand and we've got each to drive the other. I can't go and write a paper for AAAI saying, and here's what I did looking, you know, what a great system. Even Eric in his talk, he, he even. kept punching it even, even. Eric, right, even Eric, right? <laughs> kept, he gave us all these lovely examples, right? I loved your talk because you had all these examples. But if all I walked away from your talk was, oh, and you can do smart flow, and you can do this, and you can do that. But what I saw was, oh, my God, Bayesian networks and decision theoretic reasoning can really influence this whole plethora of things. And I'm sure you have to innovate in so many different well, ways I should, I should to make say, each I should, of I should say that the, you know, the reason I'm, I'm passionate about these applications is that it helps me explore the, the, uh, the problems with taking my closed world models into the open world and Absolutely. that extends theories. And I Look, think it's crucial for making so Jim, AI now you're trying to go So, so I'm here. the scruffy on the panel, right? So, so I'm, I'm the last person. I didn't mean in any way to say applications are bad. But an awful lot of what we are now teaching our students to do is not really to think as creatively as many of us were taught to think when we were students. But let me, let me, let me see if I can, I can explain it this way. This was the thought experiment I played when I was at DARPA to, conv to try to convince uh, some people to put some money into AI. Supposing you take the things we know how to do in AI and you, you kind of take this big table and say that's the space of applications 
that we know how to do AI. And almost every pro you, you take this technique and you say, which of those could it do? And, you know, it covers a big piece. And you got the next one and it covers a big piece. And the next one it gets, uh, okay. So now you got your table covered with these circles, right? Well, well, two problems. One is, there's a lot of stuff outside the table that those circles aren't covering. But the second one is, we still don't have a technique where we can cover that whole table. Because each of those circles has been, is, is focused on a different way of looking at things. They make contradictory assumptions to each other. So the meta-reasoner that was originally in my sin and was talked about 50 years ago and 40 years ago as, as a key thing in AI, this notion of really trying to plan through a space of techniques and a space through of problems to solve. Right? You, you don't hear about that so much anymore. And, and I, you know, Lise was right about talking about bringing some of that back, she, that these are opportunities. But, but again, you know, you, you are pro, very often the application space follows what we know how to do with the technique. What's nice is when you get a big problem thrust and you like the sensor problem, where you say, hey, um, you know, the stuff we do doesn't work. That's where new invention comes from. But in fact, in AI, we're, we, we've become much more adverse mm -hmm. than we once were as a field to work on the stuff we don't know how to do. So, uh, and, so, and that's all I want to so I'll thanks, stop Jeff. I, I'm, So uh, Jeff had a comment. Uh, yeah, so a couple of the uh, panelists um, expressed some dismay at uh, sort of grand challenge problems, and I, I wanted to draw you out a little bit more on that. If you take um, something like the challenge of driving a car through a busy city, I mean, that requires a lot of forms of perception, audio, visual perception, uh, fusing these forms of information, planning. Uh, understanding what the people driving around you are doing, um, trying to decide if the person to your right is, is trying to cut you off, and if so, if you're going to be a nice guy that day or you're going to be aggressive and try to do a counter maneuver. Uh, what's not to like about that sort of thing? So I think it's great. And as a matter of fact, I have a much lower um, uh, AI complete problem than when Carlos did his... Um, uh, proposal came up to me and I think it satisfies or should satisfy Jim as well because it's something I don't know how to do and it's help deal with information overload with my email inbox if I could have an intelligent assistant that can help me um, you know sort through and be more productive and figure out which things are important and get it on my calendar list correctly and so on um, I think that that would be great and you know, it's something that helping to understand how to organize that information, reason about attention, reason about resources, and reason about, you know, the social context of the messages, the stuff that's not actually in the message that I know, uh, learn from, you know, feedback and what I do. So is, is, know, so is, is, is the dream you come in in the morning and look at your sent mail folder to see what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. Okay, so, Mike. Uh, just on the question of, of challenge problems, it's actually related to uh, uh, something that I've you know, thought about a lot, which is the role of these of kind of research competitions, which are more and more common. Um, basically, you know, since there are so many uh, worthwhile problems to solve. It's not like we need to invent new ones. You know, it could be that there's some overall misallocation and no one is focusing on this you know, key combination of capabilities that would put it all together and so you want some kind of coordinating force to do that. Or you want a coordinating force to get people to focus on some kind of common domain just for the purpose of being able to build on each other's results and compare them and, and, and combine them. But you've got to have a balance because you don't want central um, creation of problems because that may miss the opportunities that you get when you have a whole community of people also inventing the problems as well as the techniques. That's the trade-off, I think. Thank you. We have a comment. Question Hi. Here. Uh, so in the remaining three minutes, I'll shift the discussion to the small topic of privacy. Uh, 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 it was striking to me that, that, that in, in uh, the panel's opening statements there was a uh, reflection on, on this kind of cognitive uh, versus computational approach to AI and, and a recognition that privacy posed some sort of challenge. And I'm, I guess I'm curious to know whether you think it's just a, a stumbling block or something that, 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 that AI in one version or another, depending on your flavor up there, um, uh, could actually help with uh, and, and, and what that would mean and how you would approach it. 
Well, I, well, I did make a comment uh, uh, in my talk yesterday uh, in, in the opening keynote in this track that this is a critical opportunity area for, for some of the methods that we work with. Um, but you might have other comments here on the panel. I'm just a moderator here. Um, I, I think it's a big problem for AI because, you know, as a, if, if AI succeeds, then that proposes great uh, you know, threats to privacy because of the ability to use information. Uh, potentially, AI could be part of a solution. Um, however, it doesn't seem like there's a great deal of work going on in that direction. Um, the way I think it's my, my own view of the form of solution is, is having better ways of, uh, of accounting for use of information. Okay, Ob obstructing in collection of information, I think, is not going to work. Uh, but if we could somehow have better systems for um, either through audits or online, making sure that information is used for the intent that it's, it's purpose for. That's something that potentially AI can contribute to. There's not a whole lot of current backing for that as I see it. Well, and on top of that, if we understand the human side, if we understand what people will regret, find disturbing, find objectionable, we can build hybrid technological human systems because we've already seen people are not very good at anticipating what they're going to have trouble with in the future. And if you can bring in AI support to help people prevent uh, situations that they're going to regret on the privacy dimension, I think that's another area where AI can help. Okay. I have a, we have a, we started a few minutes late, so we have a couple minutes left here to get our full, full, uh, for, uh, full's worth out of the panel. Um, I'm curious to hear if, if, uh, um, you have reflections about potential disruptions to our society um, that might come, good, or, good and bad, uh, based on developments that come out of the, the, um, the fires of our, of our technology <laughs> in the next, next, couple, in the next 20 years, for example, 25 years. So I'm going to channel a colleague of mine, um, a colleague of all of ours, um, Noel Shark. Um, yeah, Noel Sharkey of Sheffield. Noel, Noel has been writing about the notion of military battlefield robots for a while now and pointing out how as we've moved forward with the technology, we've been lowering our expectations of the criteria before we're going to let the machine pull the trigger. And I think as that kind of thinking has been, people surrounded by computers and seeing so much that can be done by their machines and by the web and by things like that who don't understand the technology actually think there's far more capability in this in the system than they than they have right now and i think it's that lowered expect that lowered opinion of what a human is compared to a machine opens the door for just this huge amount of abuse and and i think there's plenty of people out there who will be very happy to abuse it if we let that happen. And it, in fact, one of the places where a lot of my thinking about needing a bigger definition of AI or, or, or needing to embrace the what we can't do comes from is, is, again, because of people's expectation that we could do all this stuff. Okay. Carlos. Yeah, so I want to take a more positive view, if possible. Uh, I think. Uh, no, I don't think it's a disaster. So, in fact, I think the web has really changed things, as we all know, and I, and I believe that AI has had a big impact on this, even though we don't get much recognition for it. And as this technology changes and improves, I think the way that the web has revolutionized the way that we think right now, I think AI will do the same way. If you think about how machine translation systems, for example, could bring people together, how automating a uh, number of tasks that we do could actually let us think more and get away from more of the issues of every day. I think this could be really, really impactful and really amazing for us as a society. So I think that's wonderful, but I'm not willing to give up on doom and gloom yet. I think there's some examples <laughs> out there <laughs> that show Banjo's that here. it's easier and there's greater incentive to develop systems that support individuals than systems that support communities and societies. You see this in the stock market. You know, why do we have mechanisms where humans stop program trading? How about this? You, you may name one, I name one. And then we'll go back and forth. And well, we where, could. Who, 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 I, but the question was about disasters. There's a couple minutes left to and, Carlos, and I so think I don't know about this. There's, there's, there's hope here. equilibrium there. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a challenge here because we see a lot of systems that basically help people with greed or with greed without respect to the good of society. 
if we're going to have this not lead to decay, that means people have to adopt challenges of developing systems whose goal or whose client is the collective rather than the individual. And I think we're capable of doing that, but I think the incentives haven't been set up to induce people to put nearly as much effort in that direction. Other comments on this? Or? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll stop there and thank our panelists very much and the audience as well. Thank you very much. We'll have, a, have a break now.